Welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to an episode of Outside the Panels. I'm your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes, and at the time we're recording, football season hasn't started. The the preseason's done and done. The Dolphins still have a chance to win the Super Bowl. <sighs> Everything is good in the world. Joining me today is a creator who's having a look at the, uh, I suppose you'd say, extramarital strife of a certain uh, universal monster. To cast some ideas on what we're talking about, it is writer, creator, um, artist. It's Richard Fairgrave. Richard, how's it going? It's good. It's good. It was. Um. It, it's, it was, it's jarring when you hear a British accent talk about uh, football. I was. Oh, I, was like, I, I think he means soccer. No, no. I mean, I mean, I mean NFL. I am. Yeah. I'm, a, I I'm a hardcore Dolphins fan. So there you go. I'm, I'm familiar the with teams. the Dolphins from a movie I saw once. <laughs> That'd be S. Ventura, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm of a certain age. <laughs> Hey, everyone, every time I say Dolphins, like, Dan Marino, wasn't he in an Ace Ventura? I'm like, yeah, that's what he's famous yeah. for. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, Honestly, enough for... <laughs> you, you've now answered a question I've had for years, was, is Dan Marino uh, a real person, or did they make him up for the movie? Oh, he's a real person. At one point, he's... he owned every, every passing record in the NFL at one point. Um, he broke the single-season touchdown record uh, with 48 touchdown passes, in 1984, then went and scored, did 44 on the next year. Um, only recently, his record's been broken by the likes of Peyton Manning and uh, Tom Brady. So there you go. Never won a Super Bowl for all, the, all of that. Tell you, man, hardcore Dolphins fan. Go on. Yeah, did that, yeah. Ask me about OJ McDuffie and you'll be really impressed. Uh, <laughs> Richard. A lot of men have said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, any, any sharp line works, right? Okay, Richard. Enough football shenanigans. You're here to talk about this, this book, and it's called The X Wives of Frankenstein. So I have one, one burning question. Yes. How many Y X Wives does a universal monster need? Well, see, here's the thing. So my my book is about uh, just to give the basic premise. It is three years after a, a modern reimagining of the Frankenstein mythos. So mm-hmm. modern day, three years since the monster rampaged through the city. And uh, he and Victor Frankenstein disappeared and were presumed dead. Now, Elizabeth Frankenstein, Victor's wife, and the bride of Frankenstein are reuniting on the day that their husbands are found alive and living as a gay couple in the Arctic Circle. And so it's a story exploring the chaos of their lives as their respective husbands are returning to the city as uh, heroes of the queer online communities, science bros, MRAs, and Reddit. Cool. So yeah. when you say modern retelling, you mean an absolutely bang up to date mm-hmm. retelling, basically. Yeah. <laughs> All right, excellent. So this is on Kickstarter. Um, yes. We're going to show the um, the trailer that you have. Um, let me just get this all primed for you over on your Kickstarter page. Um, and we'll go from there for you. Let's see. There it is. And it, so here we go. This is the trailer uh, for the book. Here we go. Where am I at? Admittedly, it doesn't give a lot away. <laughs> no, it does not. I <laughs> like. I am leaning so hard into this um, a sense of immediacy in art mm-hmm. these days. I I'm no longer scanning my pages. I photograph mm-hmm. them. I want everything to look as much like the originals as possible, so there's no digital alteration to anything. Okay, cool. Um, I spent years doing like you know normal 
big air quotes, normal comic book art where I would draw it, scan it, color it digitally, do my lettering digitally. Mm -hmm. And I started just piece by piece stripping back all of the pieces that I didn't like doing. And that was mostly the stuff that was on the computer. And so my past few books, um, I did a, a memoir called Octopus that came out earlier this year. And then mm -hmm. uh, the first volume of Haunted Hill. And now this one are hand-drawn, hand-colored. Um, they're, you know, I, 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 I do the uh, inks with a light table over the pencils that are like very messy and loose. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just really trying to like capture everything. And then even with this one, I kind of took it a step further with the covers for all of these issues are uh, actual physical sculptures that I'm making and photographing. All right. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting indeed. So I have to say, I absolutely, one of the things I love about um, certain websites, I can't say them by name because of the competition, Comic Vine, uh, but when they <laughs> used to go to cons, they'd always give these artists like things to do, like, I don't know, Spider-Man eating a hot dog or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, the guys would go at it and, and do whatever. I love how the mechanics of drawing and art come to life. I mean, we look at your trailer there, and I'm I'm thinking, what which pens are you using for the colors? What you know, because I mean, just how you lay them on, they just look as if the watercolors. And I just mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how that kind of that kind of technique works. So, well, I can I can reveal everything. Um, well. The the <laughs> colors are all done with the uh, those like dual brush pens that come in like a pack of ten and look like look like this. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, cool. the, um, what is the brand on these things? The Tombow. Um, dual brush okay. pens. Uh, the line work is all um, either the Futunosuke, um hard brush pen or the Zebra hard brush pens. Okay, cool. Um, which I kind of, depending, I, I, I live in two countries, and so just depending which one's easier to get at the time, I will buy yeah. 50 of and work my way through very rapidly. Yeah. I think I'm using the Stadler Microns at the minute, but uh, I, I am, I'm nowhere hate, near as. I hate those pens. Everyone loves those pens, and I like. I actually, I, I'm the kind of person I, I never like get angry on the internet about pieces of culture. Like I'm not going to be the person who will tell you why a movie sucks, but like uh -huh. I, when I touch those pens, I want to go to war. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I just have this like, and I have a bunch of them. I keep buying them thinking like, maybe I'll get it right. Maybe I'll understand why other people like mm. them. And I like, they feel gross to hold. They're a bad thickness. They're a bad weight. I feel like my hand is slipping up and down on them. I get like squicked out by the, um, like the feel of the printing on the outside of the pens. And then obviously like the, the, the markings on them come off so quickly. So you never really know which one you're, you're grabbing until you look at the nib. Yeah. And when you scan them, everything comes through like very rough on the edges. Ugh. Yeah, I, 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 you know what? There are, you're not wrong. I think there are a couple of times I think it's just my 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 dodgy art because I'm nowhere near as talented as I just do this. I doodle for fun. Um, so I kind of and I see the scratchy line that he produced something. Is that me? Yeah. Is that the pen? I don't know. No, it's it's, but, the, pen. Um... it's, it's, it's the pen. Like, um, if I'm doing really fine stuff, I use the Koinor repeatograph. Um, mm -hmm. like pens which which are like one really nice two horrible to travel with because the pressure of being in an airplane causes the ink to like go everywhere through them and then right. clog up and then they're kind of destroyed and like they have these fine wires you have to deal with if you're and when you're cleaning them you have to buy special mm -hmm. products that are illegal in some countries it's a nightmare as well but like the lines that they put out are so nice see ink is my ink, ink is my problem i don't mind i can I like drawing and I can do the framework and, you know, predominantly superhero stuff. Um, but then I go to ink it, that's when the wheels fall off. <laughs> but, but, you know. Um, which do you prefer? Do you prefer... How, so talk to me... In fact, I'll tell you what, we'll change that question on. Talk to me about your creative process. So you, you write ink, colour, letter, put the staples in. <laughs> no, I, I, I have... I have a printer who puts the staples in for me, fortunately. Um, <laughs> so how does this process work for you? Do you, you kind of get the idea first and, and then kind of map out the, act, the, the, like the key sequences, how you're going to get from point A to point B? Do you draw kind of like um, storyboards to get you in the mood for, for attacking the project? How does that kind of work, especially as you're doing like everything? Um, I work really fast. Uh, I really enjoy 
the I like I I have a lot of projects that when I've been working for larger publishers, like I will have to wait months and months between like notes on scripts and things. Mm. And of course, by the time I come to draw it, I'm like, I don't care about this anymore. Um, <laughs> so with, with, with everything I'm doing on my own, it's very much like uh, I will write, I'll start writing the issue and um, I will say to myself, I'm going to write the entire script before I start drawing. And then I realized that like after about three or four hours of writing, my brain is a little bit foggy and maybe I can't mm -hmm. do any more writing that day. And then I have nothing else to do. So I have to draw. And so I'll start doing like just some like rough sketch stuff, but usually mm -hmm. it ends up being the layouts. And then usually by the end of the first day, I have enough script for six pages of comic and I've finished drawing the first two. Mm -hmm. And then I will kind of just like, draw six pages at a time and then write the next six and just do it on the <laughs> loop every two or three days. Um, I do layouts. So I've, I've got a big whiteboard and I do very rough layouts, but it's mostly just to figure out like where does the page begin and end? Cause I know mm -hmm. how much that, that page is a unit of time yep. and I want to like have that figured out. But then when I come to actually draw the page, I will almost always look at what I have and say, okay, now I know the start and end points. What can I do to make this more visually interesting? Like, how can I make this a whole piece? Um, mm. With this book specifically, uh, I wanted it to feel very like uh, uh, claustrophobic. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're mostly in the bride's apartment for the entire issue, and it's a very small studio apartment. And I wanted it to feel uncomfortably close, cluttered, and dirty. And so I have a lot of small panels, a lot of little little inset panels of her being anxious and pulling at the stitching mm -hmm. in her arms, um, and a lot of like cramped bathroom spaces and things, and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, people seeing through other things, kind of to imply that there's no way you could get a camera into this place without mm -hmm. having something in the way. So a lot of like, let's see them through a glass, let's see them through a candle, let's see them through an old Chinese food container, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, so it ends up being, I think it averages like 11 panels per page. Um, yeah, I did notice there's a, there's a little bit of the Tom King in there. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I like a lot of panels um, traditionally. Cause I, I'm, like, I'm very conversational with my writing, mm. and I, I want to be able to like not just have the right words on the page, but have the words broken up at the right timing and have the mm -hmm. facial expression change. You know, like sometimes you'll be saying a sentence and you will change your mind halfway through it. And I want to be able mm -hmm. to capture that change of mind. Mm -hmm. um, especially in a story like this, where so much of it is about these these two women who really, they need each other, but they don't <coughs> like each other. And yeah. they're always kind of having to do the math of like, how do I, how do I let this person know that I want them to leave without actually letting them go? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I've, I've read the 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 stuff you sent over, and the, there was a a couple of things we we're going to talk about in that in the in the book. And we'll show some pages of it um, as well. Um, for me, when, when you think about the creative process, how do you stay focused? Because I, I, so, so for my example, I'll be drawing something just doodling, and I'll be like, oh. Batman, and I'll go and just do Batman, and you know, and I'm, then now I've got like this Wonder Woman picture half done because I'm now thinking about Batman. I'm not really focusing on, you know, what I'm saying. So if you're trying mm -hmm. to do the writing and then the art, and then you get to the point where you're like, oh yeah, but this could happen. Now you're in writing mode. So then, how do you kind of stay on track to to complete what you need to? Are you very disciplined, or do you kind of just if if ideas spark, then get them down as quick as you can? It's a, it's a mixture. Um, I try and have a lot of distractions around me and I don't mean like, um, I don't mean like big distractions. I mean, like if, if you see like the wall behind me over there, there's just pictures everywhere. And in mm -hmm. front of my drawing desk, it's like even more insane. And it's, uh, this mixture of like just dense drawings that I like some things I do, like really don't like that. I will just look at to try and figure out what's wrong with them. Um, photos of everyone I know, a lot of printouts of pictures from Google image searches for community theater Shrek, because it makes me really happy to see those costumes. Um, <laughs> uh, like I have a just, ball, I guess. <laughs> stuff everywhere, right? And and then on top of that, I'll always have uh, either a podcast or a, or a movie or an audio book playing um, so that I just have like, if I if, if if my eye wanders from the page, it's never going to wander far enough for me to leave the table, yeah. and so it kind of just keeps me in that mode. And then I on top of that, like a 
like a complete insane person, um, I have a series of buzzers and bells and alarms that go off through the day so that I'm always hyper aware of how much time is passing and how much closer okay. to death I am getting so that I have to, you know, get everything <laughs> finished. Cool. I, hear, I hear what you say about distractions. I'm, if I'm, if I'm writing review for comic crusaders, um, I'll put like a ball game on. So, mm -hmm. um, football season's just about to start. So I'll, I've got baseball games, so I'll put a baseball game on. You know, a baseball game lasts for like four days, right? So mm -hmm. I just put a baseball game on, and it's just like in the noise. I thought I was doing all right with this until my uh, stepdaughter came around and watched season one of Below Decks. You know, the reality show on Hey You about the the it's like really cheesy bad TV show. Um, yeah. I'm trying to write this review. It took me two hours to write a paragraph, and why did it take me two hours to the paragraph? Because it, I got into this show. It's down. Oh right there, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, like, Damn it. Damn it. I, can, I can put on movies if I've seen them before, but anything new, if it's good, um, I, it will distract me. Um, yeah. Like, I, I watched Mad Men for the first time two years ago, and, like, I'm mm -hmm. just behind. Um, I, I allow myself also. 12 minutes each morning while I eat breakfast to watch television for pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good. I don't have work-life balance on any level. Um, <laughs> but I, I watched, I put Mad Men on while I was working, and I got nothing done. Like the show was just too good. I just stared at it, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm a workaholic as well. Like I, I, I've been up since four this morning. I will be up until probably one. You know, it's just I don't like sleep. I resent being in bed. I think naps are a practice for death. Okay. <laughs> fine. Extreme, but fine. Um, what was it about? Let's take the book up to its modern, its modern, I suppose, modern leanings. You've got Victor and the monster in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, was it important to get the LGBTQ element plus all in, in into the book? Is that kind of, um, I suppose, recognition of of LGBT in society? Is it important to have that in comic books? I mean, I think like art reflects reality and, and, and queer people exist. Um, so yes, but it also tends to like factor pretty heavily in a lot of my works. Um, okay. I really, I, I really don't enjoy a lot of, um, especially gay representation. I find it really yeah. like um, oversimplified to a point of being alienating where it's the, the, the narrative used to be, um, here is a gay character, they will be punished and die. Won't it be yeah. sad? Other people will learn. Um, and now it has become, here is a gay character because they came out, their entire life became a magical rainbow. Here, buy some products. And I think that there are a lot of like, I, I want to live in a world where there are nuanced and problematic and shitty and wonderful gay characters in in, in the world. I want, I want sloppy dirtbags like me to get to exist alongside the um, family friendly version of, of, of the gay lifestyle that my mother can tolerate on television. Oh, okay. uh, That's a show. Yeah. And I really like the idea of like, I, I'm not, I'm not centering the monster. I'm Victor and the monster in this at all. Um, it is about, it is about their, their ex-wives. It is about the lives of these two women who are at odds with each other because both of them were essentially created for the pleasure of men who then mm. weren't interested in them. Um, in in the original novel in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, really early in the book, it actually says that like Victor says that uh, Elizabeth was adopted when he was five and presented to him, and he was told, "This is your sister Elizabeth. She mm -hmm. is here for your every pleasure." And then he grows up and marries her. Like it's 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 quite gross. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously the bride is literally built from parts so that the monster can have a girl too. Mm. And um, she has a real chip on her shoulder toward Elizabeth because she doesn't know that history. She doesn't know mm. that Elizabeth was given to Victor as a child. Mm -hmm. um, so she just thinks like, like this old, this, this old woman who's got all of this privilege and wealth from the Frankenstein name mm -hmm. cannot possibly understand what it feels like to be, um, to have no, like they've never been allowed yeah. to have her own purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in those kinds of dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in like the way that 
the, you know, when, when, if you find out that the person you were with uh, is now like, has now come out as gay, you're not allowed to be angry about it. Like you're just, you're, you're not allowed to be angry about the breakup. It's this amazing free path. Um, that, like, or at, at least not public, right? Like, well, like you just, yeah, you're, you're I, the I, hear you, I hear what you're saying. Societal has to say, well, at least, hey, at least he didn't leave you for another woman. Uh, yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. I, I'm a, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit too liberal for this. I think, uh, Richard. I think for me, a breakup's a breakup. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't bother. It doesn't even factor in my head. If my yeah. wife leaves me for another woman, I'd be like, I'd be devastated that I lost my wife. I don't particularly. Yeah. It doesn't impact me whether she's off with another man or another woman or, or whatever. You know. Mm. Uh, but maybe but if you think about, my fault. I, I don't know. Like the the performative way that we have to interact with the world with you know with yeah. online spaces, you. Mm. If you if you break up with someone and there's no other party involved, you get to have like a little period of being a bit sloppy, a bit angry, a bit resentful. You get mm. to go through your grief kind of publicly. Mm. If you break up with someone and it's because they are not attracted to the gender that you are, and they have now come out and done a brave thing, um, you do not get that freedom to to talk like that. Publicly. I hear what you're saying. I I hear. Because everyone's about wow, how how fantastic that person's been yeah. brave to come out, and yeah. people don't f- remember the forget the, the forgotten person in the. In I, the, I went through a, a very like complicated period. So like I'm I'm by, um, and have kind of, as a result of that, have never really had to come out. Like I just kind of, in, <laughs> indiscriminately, operated like a dragnet collecting, um, everyone through you, my entire life. You love the person you're with. That's fine. Yeah. That's absolutely um, totally fine. And so I ended up, I was, I was married to a woman for uh, seven years. And when we broke up, it became really apparent to me that a lot of people in our lives had no idea that I was sleeping with a lot of men as well. Um, and it became a really complicated thing of the marriage ended because we didn't like each other, mm-hmm. but we couldn't, we weren't sort of being allowed to talk about it in those terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, kept sort of trying to figure out like there was no real animosity. It was just like, a, we, we just grown apart. How yeah. do I position myself in the world of the internet now? Especially because soon afterwards um, I was then going through a breakup with the guy I'd been dating for four years. Um, and it turns out a lot of people didn't know. They're like, Oh, that's just Richard's weird friend. Um, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, and so suddenly it became this strange narrative where like my ex-wife was having to answer a lot of questions of like, how do you feel now that Richard's gay? Right. And that's an unfair question to put on someone who's just come out yeah. of a seven year marriage. And I, I think it's, it's, it's just hard to figure out. Mm-hmm. And I like having these characters who don't have it figured out, who don't mm-hmm. know how they're meant to react. There's a moment in issue two where um, Elizabeth very frustrated by some of the like online discourse just yells, it's not homosexuality, it's just narcissism. Because mm. Victor literally built a man to be a representation of himself. Like, he's just trying mm. to find a version of himself that he can have sex with. And I don't know if Elizabeth is right or wrong in that, but, like, mm. it's certainly a feeling that she's having on the day that she found it out, yeah, and she's well. unfortunately screaming it on a subway. <laughs> all, all feelings are genuine, aren't they? That's, a, that's mm. a, I suppose, the crux of this. Yeah. Um, I hear what you say. I mean, I think some of the some of the... So the mainstream comics are trying really hard to put diversity in the comic books, and sometimes it works brilliantly because it's mm. um, a natural storytelling uh, narrative. Other mm. times, it feels um, added on, tacked on, and, you, and I yeah. think to myself, "Why? Why are we doing this?" You know, and I, I think some of the best characters will be people like um, the Sunstone characters from from Stephen Siege. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they I don't care that it's about bondage or it has bondage in I don't care it's got lesbians in it I don't care that these two people love each other and it's mm-hmm. the relationship of how they get to that point the rest is just smoke and mirrors um, mm-hmm. and yeah on the other side of that you've got a Robin coming out as bi for no other reason than to, to prove diversity and the Batwoman co- comic when that was around was written terribly it was like the the She's a lesbian, so therefore the book has to be about her relationship with women for 12 issues. I'm like, well, I'm sure you know, we don't get 12 issues of Batman 
sleeping around and talking about the year he spent with Talia or whatever. I, I mean, just, we, I, we we also have six hundred or and something issues of Batman that like all focus on it a bit, and we also had to have like lengthy discussions about whether Batman will go down on Catwoman or not. Like, yeah, well, but yeah, the good old internet put uh, put the rest to that, didn't it? Bless them. <laughs> the 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 years are good like, for something. <laughs> when you when you have little to no queer representation uh, in in the history of comics. Mm-hmm then you have to do an overcorrect. And like sometimes those overcorrects are good, sometimes they're bad, but like all comics are either good or bad. Most comics are bad, let's be honest. Like we're always delighted when we find a good thing. No, they are. Like like but by every like half comic half of comics must be below average, right? That's how averages work. You know what? I, I wanna argue this point, but you you're not you're not far wrong. I've been I'm starting out my books today and I'm like filing and boarding and bagging and I'm thinking to myself, why am I buying this? Why am I buying that? You know, I'm buying it out of habit more than anything. Yeah. Mm. And I, I think that like these, um, like I think, for instance, I think the uh, Son of Superman stuff um, is really well written, good story. Um, mm. Him being by is a part of the story, but it's like not the driving force. It's a way to bring in new characters. Mm-hmm. I like that book. However, I think that book is really limited by being with DC because here's the thing we're never going to see is uh, the son of Superman as the act of Superman being bisexual and single. Like he gets a boyfriend minute two. And because that we, we need to make sure that Superman there, like we need to make sure there's not like a gay guy with superpowers on the loose. Like, we need to have him locked down so he's not a threat to the rest of us. And I think that sucks. And I think it's just a very real part of the world. Like, Superman gets to have complicated relationships with Laurie Lamaris and Lana Lang and Lois Lane, and that gets to be explored. Um, mm-hmm. And his weird L fetish and, um, and House of L, I guess. But um, he, that was a dumb joke, and I apologize for making well, it. Well, are you saying that? I'm just thinking Lex Luthor. I'm like, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what it always comes back to, right? Um, right. But he's like he gets to have these sorts of things. You don't get to do those kind of complicated relationships. Like, if I got the freedom to write a Superman story, and I've said this other places, but like, here's what I would do: if I, if they're like, look, it has to have some gay content. Okay, Jimmy Olsen is a bigot. That's it. That's my take on it. I want to have the world where the gay content is um, uh, Superman's son, which is it? It's John, is it John? Yeah, yeah. Um, John. Come, John comes out as bi, and. Uh, Jimmy Olsen becomes super unpleasant to him because he has mm. real deep-seated homophobia that has never had to be addressed before because there's been no gay characters around. And right. the interesting part of that is not that like Jimmy will learn a lesson, it's that John will have to contend with the fact that all of his friends will say, no, Jimmy's a great guy. He's your dad's best friend. Yeah. I don't know what you're seeing. We, he never treats us badly. Yeah. And that is the kind of nuance that like, that's what makes characters real. And that cannot happen. In, in mainstream comics. Uh, you know what? That's a great point. That is a great point. I absolutely love that idea. I'd, I'd read that book. I would mm. read that book, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Homophobic Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Um, but it's interesting because you we're talking about... When we talk about um, gay characters and, and, and gay men, predominantly Mm -hmm. in real life there is a social scene element that people do don't find attractive regardless of anything else the fact that historically or at least in people's opinion there is a lot of promiscuity in that and there's not gonna they're not gonna show someone like john for example Mm -hmm. be that kind of go out on monday go out with a guy go out with a different guy on wednesday go out with a different guy on thursday they're they're not going to show that the the very rarely show straight characters doing that well like john kent is the person for whom like distance on grinder doesn't matter he can get to you so (laughs) you can imagine the the tag (laughs) like you just can't host will travel like (laughs) you've matched with someone in scotland yes yeah (laughs) yeah I mean, it's, it, it, it's, that is the best use of his superpowers, quite frankly. I think that's awesome. I'm quite jealous. I don't even drive. I have to deal with grinder limitations on foot. <laughs> Someone on your bus route finds you attractive. <laughs> Swipe right or left. 
<laughs> Look, I, I I live in the like exact center of Hollywood. I do okay, but like, you know, it'd be nicer if I could fly. Oh dear God! <laughs> but it, it it does become that thing where um every every gay character has to be has to be locked down, and yeah. I think that like these kind of explorations, I, I I do a lot of this kind of exploration in a lot of my works, mm -hmm. um and with this one. I really wanted to look at, I, I'm always interested in the way that like homophobia and misogyny kind of just cross over a lot. They're mm. like, a lot of them come from the same place. And a lot of the beauty standards that are put on people or the expectations that are put on people are pretty similar. They're not the same, mm. but they're analogous. Um, and with this book, uh, it had been sitting in the back of my brain for so long. Um, it, it, it like this thing has existed as it was it was going to be a, a, a script and then the the woman who I was writing the script with we ended up doing a completely different book um a, a graphic novel called shed that came out last year mm -hmm. and um then I took this and we, I worked with someone else and we were we spent about a day trying to figure out if it could be a, a um stage show and uh that kind of never went anywhere we just kind of couldn't make it land and then I had this version of it where for a long time it was going to be entirely about the bride of Frankenstein mm -hmm. and have, um, you know, because she's the one who's green skinned and stitched together from other people. She's the one with no memory trying to figure mm -hmm. out who she's made up of. She's the one who technically has existed for three years, mm -hmm. um, who's still being expected to live a full and proper life and doesn't have the option of being anonymous because she is mm -hmm. green. Um, and I thought like, I could do a, a pretty a pretty interesting book following her day-to-day -day life where Elizabeth Frankenstein was this looming, almost like Biff Tannen level spiritual force who could at any point swoop in and ruin her day. And I wanted to have, um, I, like, I, I really thought that could be like a lot of fun. Oh, that, oh I'm, it's interesting that you're being sent that cover. That is the very rough first draft of a cover that is not used anywhere. Just oh. Yeah, I'm really glad that's being sent out. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> I, wonder what, I wonder, wonder what the rest is. Oh, here we go. Fingers crossed that the rest is fine. Um, it's There's a lot. I don't know if it was intentional or if it's, if it's part of the whole idea behind the book. Um, body image, I thought, played a huge part in the opening pages of this book. Mm -hmm. Um is this something that you were trying to 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 build into the into the character? Yeah, I mean, like the the complicated thing of being both a beautiful woman and horribly fetishized for being so different, uh, I think, is a really like I, I always I like that to find these kind of strange juxt juxtapositions for characters, mm -hmm. um, and so she gets to be this um, a person who is like. So, like, she's essentially iconic and struggling all at once. And everything about her is, is unknown. Like, everyone knows who she is. She doesn't know who she is. Um, she is adhering to these ideas of beauty. Um, the, the text on that first page is actually from a, a self-help book that's written by Victor Frankenstein's best friend. Um, so, like, it's always about these, like, reciting the mantra and, and remaining beautiful and all of that. Um, and this is loosely based on real stuff from a from a self-help book that i that i found as a child <laughs> did it help <laughs> uh it was definitely not for me it was it was about feeling <laughs> feeling powerful after a divorce <laughs> well, yeah. i would read anything when i was nine <laughs> <laughs> and i just i like the idea here of her just like not being ashamed of the stitching and just highlighting her mm. scars and outlining it and making it part of herself, but also kind of like, she knows that this doesn't work. She knows that she's following what the book says. It says to write, I am beautiful on the mirror and the lipstick breaks because of course it does. Um, and that's mm. like, that's the kind of tipping point for her of like, Hey, now mm. I'm just covered in lipstick and I didn't even get to finish the task. Mm. Um, and I think that that kind of, uh, like that kind of just sums up what it feels like when you when you are flailing about in life and you don't know how to feel good, so you grab onto whatever thing promises it can help you. It's the mm. reason that like 30 years into having the internet, there are still emails and scams on Facebook telling you you can make your dick bigger. 
Like, of course none you of mean those you things. Can't? Oh my god. <laughs> like, of course none of those things are gonna work, but like they play on insecurities and they play on this hope yeah. that people have of like maybe this one I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little gross here, but here's the thing. Like I saw an ad the other day that was for a product that would make you come more, like just more voluminous amounts. Right. And I, I had never thought to myself, like, I, I was like, is that a thing you're meant to like care about? Like, is that a, is, are you somehow, <laughs> like, if you didn't get that uh, worry spurts out? And I thought that's so bizarre, but like, hey, it, 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 it must work. I mean, I don't think the product works, but I think the the advertising must work because, like, like between you and I, I think I probably have a little bit more expertise on the average amount of cum <laughs> from different men. But like, it has never occurred to me to be like, I'm going to rank them by volume. <laughs> rank them by cum fill. <laughs> there must be like a lot of men out there who are like, well, I've never seen another man cum, so maybe I don't cum enough. I better buy this uh, product because otherwise people are thinking I'm somehow less. Uh, the thing that the things that drive people to insecurity is that's yeah. a book in all by itself. Um, yeah. I do like this page. This pa this panel absolutely speaks volumes to me. I absolutely love it. We've got the swirliness of the of the the lipstick going down the sink. <clears throat> You've got the kind of pathway she takes. We talk about spiraling. That's a that's a way you can show that on the page. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love that page. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I really, I, I wanted really it to feel like, like, yes, it's all going down the drain. I wanted it to be evocative of blood. You know, obviously I'm playing mm. with, like, I'm playing with horror imagery here because of, it's, it's a Frankenstein book. I might as well reference yeah. some other classics. Let's throw in a psycho reference. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, it did, it did feel like she is washing herself away at the same time. Yeah. Um, so body image is a thing for me. I'll, I'll say that right now. I think I've said it to, to people in my day job, I have a I have a negative body image element to my life, and when I see that represented in her, trying to be brave about her scars and then kind of washing them away, and then kind of it's uh, in one hand she's trying to be really proud about what who she is, and the other hand she's trying to not focus on what on those things, and that mm -hmm. that you talk about juxtaposition. That's for me how how people oh how I, I exist in in my I suppose my body image element is that you know I don't, I don't want to look big but yeah i've got to go to work with a shirt and tie on which makes my neck stand out <sighs> yeah no look i look so, i know the feeling i um i have gone up and down in weight pretty drastically in my life um i think i, I topped out about 350 and like now i'm a little under 200 and i know that if i like if my husband runs over my foot with his computer chair uh, he feels bad because he's hurt me. If I run over a piece of paper with my computer chair or if I bump into something and cause no damage or harm, I feel embarrassed because I'm a fat person who takes up too much room and I'm just like shrekking my way through the world, crashing into things. And like that'll never go away. That's, that's like mm. um, my, my friend Sarah said to me once that like the happy, like her favorite thing to do is if she hears, if she's at a party with me and she hears a glass break, she immediately looks at me because no one looks happier than me when I'm not the person who broke something. <laughs> oh dear. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I'm just... I'm no, it's, it's true. It's a great feeling. Saying. Like, yeah. not my fault. Good. Yeah. I got, when, you go to, uh, when you go to bars and there's restaurants and you hear them drop plates, mm. that's, some, some wise ass always shouts, sack the juggler. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> at least around the at least around here they do. Let's have a look at the Kickstarter. Because we do like a good Kickstarter on the show. Here we are. Because I'm based in the UK, um, this is nicely converted into pounds for us. Good oh, wow. dollars. You are sitting at two thousand and two dollars. Oh, nice! I got a pledge uh, since I've been talking to you. Three thousand gold. So yeah, that's practically seventy-five percent of the way there. Ninety-eight mm -hmm. backers. Twenty-four days to go at the time of recording. So we've still got shed loads of time on that. Yep. Um, let's have a look at some of the rewards there's the so there is there is the, the main cover that color. is the so that is a uh paper mache head that is made um over several days and all of the text all of the paper is printouts of the 20th chapter of frankenstein that i retyped to remove all the line breaks that's the chapter that addresses the bride um and then that was photographed 
I printed out the photograph. I traced the line work onto it with my light table and that's real lipstick. And then I printed Then I scanned the lipstick and the line work. And then I printed those out separately on two pieces of transparency, clipped those in front of the camera in front of the original sculpture and then photographed through it again. There's some slight augmentation for sharpness because I'm just not great with the camera yet. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, it is like, it, it's there's as little digital editing as I can possibly do. Mm. Good, 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 good. Um, <clears throat> pledge five pounds, you get the comic digitally. Um, I have to say that that's a great, <clears throat> as much as I love practical, physical comics, it has to be PDF for uh, international. I don't mind uh, dropping $5 on a Kickstarter. I do mind having to pay 25 for the shipping. <laughs> yeah, I would do anything to get the shipping down. It, like, honestly, if there are people in the UK who are going to be at Thought Bubble, reach out to me because I'm going to be I'm there gonna, and I could just, I'm gonna stop I mean, if you want to buy physical, but just like do the no reward thing and just message me that you've done that. I'll bring it to thought bubble for you. Mm -hmm. There you go. An thought idea. Bubble. Yeah, that's cool. Thought bubble for anyone who has no idea what we're talking about. It is the UK's premier comic art festival lasts all week. And at the end of the weekend, there is a, a comic con, Loads of guys, girls, everyone turns up. Creators, artist alley, whatever you want. Uh, loads of independent books on there. Get yourself over there. It's at Harrogate, which is just south from Dirty Dirty Leeds. So there you go. There you go. And I, I need to go. I've been before. I loved it. It was class. I, um, I, really, I, I applied on a whim and they were like, yeah, of course, definitely. Come along. Like, okay. All right. I'll, I'll fly to London and there is spend no, a week there with my friend. And... Yeah. There is no preconceptions about the place. There is the, the different amounts of books you get going on there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, I think last time was I, was Bendis there the last time I was there? Yeah. Bendis was there doing something. Uh, Leia Moore was there signing some stuff. Um, one of the Vampirella, right, Paul Cornell was there, if I remember correctly. I'm going back a couple of years. It was pre-COVID pre before I went last. So. Um, all right. So Deluxe Digital Comic for $7. You get the PDF, um, extra features from the print. I yep. like the so it's, process it's, images, rough drafts. I love stuff like that. That is that is my wheelhouse, like nobody's business. Yeah, so you get like the full breakdown of how the cover was made, all the photographs of that, and then a bunch of um, alternate versions of the characters from earlier versions of the book as well. Cool. This is the sewing uh, kit. So you get a real <laughs> sewing kit with a QR code. So you can stitch yourself together on the go, and then you get a QR code to download the book. I'm, I'm, I'm needing some red thread, but that's a different story altogether. Uh... There we go. Fifteen dollars gets you the the fair grey cover. Nice that one. Um, and then you've got the Hellsby. Laura cover. Hellsby, uh, their okay. cover. They are based in the UK. They will also be at Thought Bubble. So if you get that one, you can get it signed by them. Um, yeah. They are a fantastic artist, and I, I reach out to them because their style is just so like in line with the energy of the main character, and mm. uh, the, the the concept for the cover was like her cluttered bedroom with all of the nostalgic technology and junk that she's collected to just try and trigger a memory. I do love that. I do love that cover. That's a really nice cover. Uh, you've got a Steph C cover. No, that's just like, that's so cool. <laughs> just, yeah, it's more, it's more traditional when you say Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. I guess yeah. a little bit on that one. And um, she like took the inspiration for the characters for that from uh, Death Becomes Her, which is one of my favorite films. So that was done without even consulting me. And I was like, oh, you understand me. You understand my book. <laughs> uh, the mini print for 30. A headshot. Physical copy yeah, so headshot. if you scro scroll down in the main feed, there's a, there's a picture in the main part of it. Um, uh, do, do, do. There's the, I love that. I love that cover. That, yeah, that, it's, it's that, so that, good. That is the bomb. That one for sure. I love pictures that you can just like find Easter eggs in for days and days. You know. Yeah. There's a song kit. Where are we at? I think. Oh, just up, up a little bit. There it is. So. Ah, um, right. 
I'll do a five by seven original headshot of one of the two characters, um, and you get the book and that. Uh, if you want my cover, it's it's uh, thirty two dollars, and then it goes up by five dollars per thing um, cool. for the Hellsby cover or the Steph C cover. All right, cool, excellent. Yeah, cool. Got lots of different variant variant days. Oh, you get all three covers for fifty on that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. check out. Got people backing that already. That's a good call. And then there's the Richard Sachs collection where you get everything I've released so far this year in my imprint. So Octopus, Haunted Hill, um, Horror Shorts, Too Hot for Octopus. Uh, you get a print, you get a spit sticker, you get the stick, put your fingers in my hole sticker, you get a digital bundle of like 250 pages of comics. So all up like in print, it is about 400 pages of comic, I think. No, yeah, that's good. That's good yeah, good. it's a good deal. It's a good deal, definitely. And then just the, the early birds are yeah, all gone. So and then gone. Um, I've got add-ons of a bunch of my other books. Especially, like, this is the big one, Four Color Heroes. is my. Mm -hmm. It came out last month. This is my year mm -hmm. of 14 books, so there's a little bit, like, I don't have time to talk about all of them before the next yeah, one comes fine. out. So I, I fail it. <laughs> That's your workaholic month. nature coming to the fore, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all of these, and then and then just down below that is Ghost Ghost, which is 120 pages of dumb jokes about ghosts that I started when I was seven. <laughs> oh, do you me, do you me? So an absolute plethora of stuff on your Kickstarter. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah, okay. I'm, Go on. Sorry. I was just saying, like, I'm I'm going big. You know, like I I started kickstarting for the first time this year in January. This is my third. I'll have five kickstarters done by the end of the year. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, um, if you're interested in any of the uh, covers, the book, whether it be PDF or whether it be physical, check out the Kickstarter address. It's there on the screen now. Yes, I know Kickstarter addresses are long. I know there's nothing I can do about it. But if you're watching the show, you know how to use a computer. Dead simple. <clears throat> Get yourself over to kickstarter.com, type in the ex wives of Frankenstein in the search bar. That'll take you to the page. Jobs are good. What more would or, you? What more could you? Want or, to? or, you could just go to my great website, kickrichard.com, and it'll take you to whatever my current project is. There you go, kickrichard.com. Um, if you want more information on Richard and his projects, you can follow him on Twitter. Yes, I'm still calling it Twitter. Nope. No, I'm not going to call it X. X is dumb. Twitter rules. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Uh, Dead simple at Richard Fairgrave, so you'll get all the um, information up to date on there, as well as I'm sure links to Richard's website. There you go, Richard. It's been an absolute blast. I've really enjoyed it. Um, we didn't even have time for the advert. That's that's a, that's impossible. This is your last bit. This is your last chance. Give me the thirty seconds pitch on why people should pledge to the X Lives of Frank. Because you're going to get a comic like no one, like no other comic you've found. Like, I'm, I'm not even going to be humble about this. I'm very, very good at this. I've been doing it for a very long time, and I'm in love with this book. I think the best books are made from obsession, and this is something I haven't been able to get out of my head, and so I had to put it on paper. If you like complicated, nuanced friendships, if you like difficult characters that you are still rooting for, and if you like a mixture of genre fiction, body horror, that's all disguised to come across like a French film, then like x Wives or Frankenstein is going to be your dream. Cool. Excellent. Richard, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you for spending the time with me. I really do appreciate it. The book, I absolutely read the first issue that was sent over. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. I was like, Thank you. I am I am on this. I I think it's really good. I like the, I like the ideas behind it. I like the complexity of it all. Um, I like how it speaks of my insecurities in places. So, so well done. Great piece of writing. Great. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put this out there because I think it's important to say. I think you're cute as hell. So, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> just, just so you know. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so, I match with someone in Hollywood. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> 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 all right, there we go. Don't forget to check out the UCPN for all your favorite shows. Uh, we've looked at. Uh, Richard's book, and if you go, if you like books of a certain age, check out the Old Timers comic book show. The new episode is all about black and white comics. So 
some Eclipse in there, some uh, Jerry Hands of Kung Fu, some classic Gene Cole and stuff. So black and white comics, I'm going to come back. There you go. Kind cool. of links, kind of a little bit. Richard, so glad you took the time, man. I really do appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I've been your host, Johnny Machine Hughes. And as always, adios. Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.